All right, so this lecture is going to be about uh, chapter 12, and I'm going to start by just really going into some of the stuff that the book isn't clear on. So let's get started. All right, first thing I want you to remember about this chapter is on all the examples in the book are experimental and they seem unrealistic. And yeah, like the way they've like framed the experiments, you know, four people meeting and deciding whether or not to trade and deciding who they can talk to or not, like that's totally unrealistic. However, the practical applications of the topic are pretty broad and they include things like Airbnb rentals, uh, spending time with friends and a bunch of other stuff. So what I want you to think about in this section is this is a general form of exchange networks. The specific thing when you're thinking about, for example, opportunity costs is time is a scarce and non-renewable resource. So when you're talking about spending time or using time, these exchange networks make a lot more sense. So if we're talking about time, um, you might think of resources that would otherwise be divisible, meaning, you know, I might be able to produce, you know, a hundred cups, but for a limited time, I can use one cup. And in exchange networks, like we're talking about here, it's this time you're using that one cup that makes the most sense. And that's kind of really what we're going to focus on. So if you think back to the previous chapter about suppliers and traders, the supplier themselves has this object to trade. And if they're not able to trade it at the time they want to, then they have to wait until the next time. That means they've given up an opportunity cost by having to wait. So we got to think about um, in like general terms, an asset becomes scarce over time. For example, thinking about Airbnb, I can rent my house today for you know someone to stay spend tonight at my house and feed them breakfast and they'll pay me for it. If I don't rent my house today, I've lost that opportunity. When we're talking about friendship networks, usually you would think about um, attention, or this is the Russell Haynes theory of exchange networks in friendship, and that is you have to have like someone needs to be paying attention to you. You know, they have to take you out for a drink and listen to your boring conversation. And if you are alone that night, then you're sad. But if, you know, someone does take you out, then you get that benefit. So this, I'm just emphasizing, hopefully, that this is a real thing. And in spite of how unrealistic those experiments seem, like this is real stuff. Not only that, this bargaining stuff actually applies to like the actual maintenance of an edge, okay? So we, we put in an edge because we want to exchange resources over that edge. But maintaining the edge itself also requires some like resources. So if you let an edge and you never use the edge, eventually you lose the, you know, the edge will just disappear. No one's going to talk to you anymore because you keep ignoring them. So if the exchange isn't worth it. The edge is going to like not be used. And so it starts to decay, let's say. So it's important to remember a powerful party may give up some resources just to maintain an edge. That is just to give the other person or to keep that person interested. So even though you might have this sense of like, you know, hey, if I'm talking about someone who has, you know, millions of subscribers, that that person with the million subscribers is actually giving up a little bit of their own resources to maintain, you know, the, and try to get that million and one million and one anyway, the next subscriber and keep the ones they have. So in the experiments we saw, where there's participants are not going to accept a zero bid, that's that factor. Okay. I'm not going to just give away my attention for nothing. I'm not going to be your subscriber for nothing. In the previous chapter, we also operationalized that 
by this marginal value. That is that you, there's a value of just making an exchange even if you didn't get any profit for it. So remember that idea. Now I'm going to review next and the review is about the trader intermediary network. I want to focus right now on the supplier. So the node's position affects its payoff. Trader 1 has a monopoly on supplier 1. Because there's no alternatives, S1 has to accept that zero um, extra amount. Okay, They have to accept it. When we added this second trader, now there's competition here. And that means S1 can bargain here. Okay. T1 and T2, the two traders are completely dependent on supplier 1. S1 can exclude one of them, and S1 gets enough return from just having one of them. So we did this already, and we saw that you know T1 and T2 have to um, bid 1 to supplier 1 in order to get supplier 1's bid, because they are completely dependent upon them. Now, it gets a little more complicated, actually, than what the previous chapter said. When we have a new supplier come in, we have a situation here where S1 is the only supplier to T1. S1 can also supply to T2. And then we have here where S2 has a monopoly over, um, or S2 is monopolized by T2. What I want you to think about here is we did have the thing, you know, there's competition now. There's competition between S1 and S2, so in theory they might accept this lower bid. But what we're actually going to do is do a little bit more sophisticated of analysis, and the actual things of the previous chapter become a little more complicated here because, example here, you know, T2 can be excluded. And so even though T2 has a monopoly on S2, S2 does have some leverage or power in this network and can insist on a higher bid. So S2 does not have to accept a bid of zero in this situation. We will, uh, you've actually seen this in the, net, in the chapter where it actually happens. So what I can do here is if you imagine looking at these networks, and you just fold them out into a four node network, that's actually what we're seeing here. Okay? So in a way you're going to see, you know, T2, S2, S1, T1, that that's that four node power network that if you just folded it out, that's what it looks like. All right? So first these are just going to be reviews. Um, if we have that three node network here, you know, you can see that's the folded out version where we had, you know, supplier one might be in the middle, trader one and trader two on the outside. Um, I'm just going to say this, you, you hopefully remember this, this idea of a stable outcome means the two nodes don't have a reason to, ch to change. The top one is not stable because C would offer to take less than a half and that would make both B and C better off. Interestingly enough, the most stable one here is where B is taking all the goods and we've noted earlier that there would actually be a tiny fraction because A and C wouldn't play for nothing. They'd have to get something out of it. Okay, so stability is the idea that two, that two nodes don't have a reason to change. Okay, so instability is defined when you have two nodes that are connected by an edge that's not trading and if that edge the nodes on that edge are not getting a total payoff of one, then it's unstable. So this top diagram is not stable because B and C are connected by an edge, but that edge is only getting a total of three out of four, or three quarters of a unit, or whatever it was here. And what we can see here, hopefully, is that C could offer B, okay, some amount and actually get less than one quarter in this trade-off, okay? I'm showing here two examples of stable ones. So the middle one, there is no node that can make an offer that gives both of them a higher payoff. So here we've got B and C. This I'm in the middle diagram here. B and C are both getting one half. And C can't make an offer to B that would get C and B both a higher payoff. Okay. 
This is a Nash equilibrium here, that one half, one half, one half, one half, that's stable, and it's also a Nash equilibrium. The bottom one with the two thirds, one third, one third, that one's also stable, okay? So C you know, can't offer B more and get a higher payoff than two thirds, but we'll see later that, has, that one has additional properties we'll be thinking about. All right, what about a five node path? Um, there's this lovely one here where if you look at this all the way through and you start thinking about the bargaining, you'll notice here on the top one, the BC link needs to total one, otherwise C can offer B or D more and they'll both get a higher payoff. Same with the second option down, you know, C can offer more to B or D and get a higher payoff. And so the bottom line interestingly happens when you know, both B and D are getting one. Um, there's this little question here, if there are an odd number of nodes, the only stable solution is when the outside node gets zero. And yeah, I mean, you're gonna have to think of that one yourself and we'll discuss it when we're in the lecture. All right, next up, we talked about stable and I told you the one half, one half, one half isn't necessarily evolutionarily, or it isn't, um, it's stable, it's a Nash equilibrium but we also showed the two thirds, one third option. And I'm just gonna note here, the one half, one half is stable. It's a Nash equilibrium, but it isn't necessarily evolutionarily stable. What I'm meaning to note here is this one half, one half, one half option could persist forever. But if at any point a higher share for B or C appeared, then we would have it eventually or we could eventually evolve to this one-third, two-third, two-third, one-third option, which is the balanced solution that we're actually gonna talk about uh, right now, okay? So the balanced solution considers what's happening here with the outside options. And what we're saying here, um, thinking about outside options is, you know, what could B, if we're just looking at B, B right now is getting one-half from A, and it could get one-half from C. And so, you know, yeah, that's balanced. Um, and what the issue here is, is that A, their only outside option is zero. And so in theory, B could put more pressure on A and get more out of it. So that's how we lead to the balanced solution. Now, leading to the balanced solution, which is, this is the definition from the book, you hopefully remember this, that is the traders receive their outside options and divide the remainder in half. So looking at this, this is a new one, okay? So we've disrupted the balance a little bit and here B is insisting on three quarters where they used to get one half. And if, um, so C and D, <clears throat> or if they were keeping the same uh, bargain, A and B should share this one half surplus equally. So notice B could get one half from C, um, A can't get anything because they don't have an outside option. And if we divide up this outside or the surplus here that B is getting, we divide that in half. And in theory, you know, A gets a quarter and B gets three quarters. That actually messes up everything else though. And things become, in terms of balance, out of scale on every square. And so if you look at it and think about it in game theory terms, this is going back to the one half, one half, one half, one half, and the, you know, the offers and everything else. What we're looking at here is, you know, if player C makes a certain offer of one half to either D or B, then they get a payoff of one half. If player C offers a quarter to D and B, what happens here is you know, D has to accept it, but B won't accept it. And so what happens then is that um, this is when we, you know, we start looking at here, what's the dominant strategy here? And the bottom line ends up being as will, that will shift, okay? So before, remember we had the one half, one half, that was a Nash equilibrium but with the emergence of this option where we're gonna offer three quarter, or really offer, just offer one quarter and keep three quarters for ourselves, that that ends up being uh, the option. The issue though is this, if B and C offer too little, A and D might just refuse to trade. 
So at a certain point, A might just say, hey, you know, forget it. I'm not taking one quarter. I'll, I'll take my ball and go home. Well, that's definitely an issue. And that's where the idea of the balance comes from. So the balance is only there to make A and D happy enough to continue trading. And that's what the balance idea is. So looking at it again, <clears throat> C and D should change the options here. Okay, so if we just keep these, you know, this one quarter, three quarter, which we talked about way back, now C and D are going to bargain differently here. The C's outside option is um, one quarter, and there's a three quarter surplus there. So remember, everybody gets their outside option and they split the surplus. So C and D split, if they split that surplus, what should happen here is C should be at 5 8 and D should be at 3 8 And so now we've got a new set of bargains and we would keep going and going and going. And eventually we end up on what's called the Nash bargaining solution. And that is where they're, they're splitting the surplus. So with the one third, two third, B's outside option is a third, C's outside option is a third. They're each splitting the two thirds that is the surplus. So half of it goes to D, D gets one third. Half of it goes to C, C gets one third of half of the surplus plus their outside options. And so once you're balanced, this Nash bargaining solution would be evolutionarily stable. So again, this is like that implicit bargain between the A and D points that say, look, you know, I might take my ball and go home unless you share, you know, you give me my share of the credit. So that's it. And um, we'll, you know, hopefully talk more about this or other things next time.